Welcome to episode 255 of the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro Podcast, recorded live on November 5th, 2021. This is a show about Microsoft 365 and Azure from the perspective of IT pros and end users, where we discuss the topic or recent news and how it relates to you. In this episode, Scott and Ben follow up on announcements for Microsoft Teams from Microsoft Ignite, and then Scott takes a few minutes to chat with Henry Yan about the upcoming Azure IaaS Day. Hey, Scott, guess what happens when I buy a new computer? Like I said, I wasn't going to do. <laughs> Normally, I would go with, yes, this is the new computer, but we go through this every single week. <laughs> it is not this bad every week. The incantation of things that you have to do and like the Rube Goldberg machine that you have built to enable audio and video from your microphone and your camera into whatever the heck you've got going on in the rest of your computer is quite the quite the machination. Like <laughs> I, I don't understand. Every week it's hot button. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I see uh, sometimes I see a mouse moving, like, but no sound. <laughs> sometimes I have sound, but no video. You know, I'm waiting for the video. It's going to start focusing on something in the background in a second. Like it's You've got stuff going on, you know? (laughs) I try to keep you entertained, Scott. I try to give you something exciting to look forward to on Fridays. I don't know. Well. But no, that's why I got a 43-inch monitor, so I can get all the windows for all the different pieces of software and stuff that I have going during the podcast. It's not for work. (laughs) So I can see all the podcast settings in one screen. Yeah, I'm glad that you can see all the screen, but none of the settings work, so. They actually, yeah. You know what, though? I'm actually impressed that it worked as well and as quickly as it did on the new laptop. Like, it wasn't so complicated that I couldn't recreate it. Well, things are getting easier for you. They are. If only there's a couple... Things. Well, I guess some of it can't. But yes, I did go out, Scott, and I bought the new MacBook Pro. I said I was going to be able to get by a year or two on my Intel. And it's probably an excuse. I was having video issues and I didn't feel like trying to figure out what was going on. So I just figured why not buy a new computer, right? Right. Especially when the video issues aren't from your computer. They're from the video input device, which is external to your computer. No, because that worked fine in some software, just not Teams or Zoom. I'm blaming Teams or Zoom. <laughs> some some video codec. No, I don't know. I did go out and get the new 14-inch MacBook Pro. In my video is not the only reason. I looked at the trade-in on my 16-inch and what I wanted for my 14-inch configuration. And I have a dollar amount that I like to average out to per year on what I spend on my computer hardware. And Given all of the different things I looked at and early benchmarks of this M1 Max, so I did get the M1 Max chip, it kind of actually made sense to pull the trigger and upgrade. I've been on my other one for about two and a half years now. And again, with the trade-in, I got the money out of it over the last two and a half years. And if I get this one and make this one last another two and a half, three years... Should be good. Should be good. But I have been... Famous, Famous last words. I have been very impressed with it. Yeah. Or I just needed a tax write off. (laughs) Well, IRS, I hope you're not listening. No, it's a legitimate tax write off. I use it all the time for work. Should just keep telling yourself that. My life. Do you feel overwhelmed by trying to manage your Office 365 environment? Are you facing unexpected issues that disrupt your company's productivity? Intelligent is here to help. Much like you take your car to the mechanic that has specialized knowledge on how to best keep your car running, Intelligent helps you with your Microsoft Cloud environment because that's their expertise. Intelligent keeps up with the latest updates in the Microsoft Cloud to help keep your business running smoothly and ahead of the curve. Whether you are a small organization with just a few users up to an organization of several thousand employees. They want to partner with you to implement and administer your Microsoft Cloud technology. Visit them at intelligent.com slash podcast. That's I-N-T-E-L-L-I-G-I-N-K dot com slash podcast for more information or to schedule a 30-minute call to get started with them today. Remember, Intelligent focuses on the Microsoft Cloud so you can focus on your business. Since you mentioned you bought this thing for Teams, do you want to talk a little bit about Teams today? Sure. We can talk about Teams today. 
because, well, do you want to talk about teams or do you want to talk about an event you have coming up first? Which one do you want to fit in here first? Let's talk about teams first. Okay, we'll talk about teams. Stay tuned for the end of the episode for an exciting announcement from Scott that is going to be added in post-recording. Anyways, teams. Yeah, so I did a presentation actually earlier today, a couple hours ago, and it was talking all about some of the new features that were announced at Ignite and Teams. Focused a little bit more around security, performance, management type stuff. So frankly, avoided things like MASH and some of the end user stuff and really dove into some of the announcements around the admin side of things and teams and what is coming, what's been added, what some of the stuff like was actually announced, released during Ignite 2 so you could get in and start playing with it. I think some of it even trickled out a little bit before Ignite and it was just kind of more widely talked about at Ignite. So we figured we'd take a little bit of time today and chat about some of those. Yeah. So I think the first one on your list, we talked a little bit about this last week. I don't know if you've kind of learned anything new about it, but the ability to manage team sites from the SharePoint admin center and very specifically capabilities to do things like manage private channel sites and have the ability to go in and see which ones have been created, where they reside, so how many of these do I have within my tenant, which teams have private channel sites associated with them, and then what are those sites? Yeah, so this was one of those I was actually pleasantly surprised with, where they said it would be available everywhere by end of year 2021. So legitimately, they have like another two months to roll this feature out. I went into my tenant like day one of Ignite and the channel sites feature did not show up by default. Like it wasn't there when I went and looked at all my list of active sites. But if I, if you scroll all the way to the right in your list of active sites and customize the columns, I just popped it open to see what was in there. And lo and behold, channel sites was listed as an available column. So I figured, eh, why not go in and add it? So I was able to add this to my tenant already day one. And it's a lot like the screenshots show. Like it says it has channel sites. And then for a couple of mine, I made sure I had some private channels in there. It says two channel sites. That's a hyperlink. And I can go in and click on the two channel sites for the hyperlink. And it gives me all of the information about the private site. So it lists the two private channels because private channels are the only thing that gets their own sites, right? So you're going to have like your top level site that got created when you created the team and then any private channels are really the only other sites you're going to have. And if I click on it, it lists them both. It gives me names, URLs. It does have the type and says that it is indeed a private channel. Primary admin for the site, storage used, sensitivity labels, uh, all of the stuff that you would expect out of a SharePoint site. And if I select one of these, I actually still get the same SharePoint blade that you would expect where I have like general tabs and I can see... Just basic information. Again, name, URL, activity. I can see permissions, any policies, external sharing policies, sensitive policies. The only thing about it, like you can't really change anything. There is an edit button that shows up, up at the top. If I select a site and click edit, it brings out the blade. But by nature of the site, that these are private channel sites, you can't actually change anything. Like I can't go in and change external sharing policies or sensitivity labels. I can't go in and change the URL of it. It's really just a view only pane of this private channel site. But as an admin, I can still go see activity in it. I can see storage used. I actually can see all of my private channel sites. So all of those SharePoint sites that previously were just hidden from view. So from that visibility into my environment and what's going on in it, it's I don't really have any complaints about it. It works kind of like I would expect it to. 
I would say. More visibility, the ability to, <laughs> like you said, see they're created and then be able to see owners and things like that and go hunt them down if you need to for additional information or whatever it happens to be. That's all good stuff. Yep. And the URL. So me as an owner, if I want to go click on the URL, what would be interesting, I haven't, I should go try this. If I'm the owner, if I'm not the owner of a private SharePoint site, but I am a SharePoint admin, if I can see it. I think I st- I'd still get access denied if I clicked on the URL, but if that's security trimmed in any way based on the owners of these private channels, that would be something I, I don't actually know because I haven't given that a try yet. Yeah, I, I don't know how that works because I imagine a lot of that information just comes through the graph and kind of what you're pulling out of like the channels endpoint on on the graph. So right. you have a group ID, you know, like that's the known thing that you're going ahead and interrogating. And there is an endpoint in the graph that you can call like the channels endpoint based on group ID and give me, you know, all of all of the channels where the membership type is private and pull those back. And then that gets you back to things potentially like being able to figure out like the, the URLs and things like that for the sites, like the file folder that are associated with them. Yep, exactly. The only thing I can't do on that column, it doesn't have a filter. So I can't like show just my SharePoint sites that have channel sites with them, but I can sort smaller to larger, larger to smaller. So, well, I can't filter out by it. If I sort larger to smaller, all of my sites with channel sites associated with them just show up at the top. So not a big deal there with the filter, but definitely a nice feature from kind of that admin visibility standpoint of things. How about another one, Cloud Shell in the admin centers? This is cool. I don't know when this hit the main admin center. The announcement at Ignite was that it's coming to the Teams admin center. So if you're in like teams, teams.admin, yeah, teams. No, admin.teams. No, I'm blanking. Teams.admin.microsoft. If you're in the Teams Admin Center, and I can't even type it, let's see if it shows up yet for me. Up in the, no, it wasn't. It was admin. Scott, make sure I t- give people the right URL. Through all of that mumbly, bumbly, jumbling, it is admin.teams.microsoft.com. <laughs> my muscle memory and my brain. We're disconnected there. But up in the upper right hand corner, you should see a little link for like the cloud shell. So you can go launch the cloud shell in the Teams Admin Center. It doesn't show up in mine. When I went and looked at the roadmap, I said it was coming mid to end of October 2021, which was like five days ago. Maybe it's still coming. But all that being said, I do have it in my main admin center. So I can go to admin.microsoft.com and up in the very upper right-hand corner, you get like your login, log out, you get your settings, there's a mobile phone, there's an admin app link. And then right next to it is like a little PowerShell icon window looking thing that launches Cloud Shell right in the admin center. So it's, I mean, essentially it's identical to the Azure Cloud Shell. If you've played with that, it's PowerShell, it's Bash. It looks the same. It is the Azure Cloud Shell. <laughs> and I was going to call that out. We're talking about Cloud Shell. It's, it's not that there is a distinct version of Cloud Shell just for Microsoft Teams admin or just for Exchange Online admin or M365 general admin. And then there's another Cloud Shell to go over and do things in Azure. It is all just one in the same construct. Like So when we say Cloud Shell, we mean Azure Cloud Shell. It's the same Cloud Shell that you're launching out of the Azure portal if you're just an Azure subscriber. It just so happens that all of this tooling has been added to the Cloud Shell over time. So the things to the commandlets, like in a PowerShell session in Cloud Shell, to connect to Exchange Online, Teams, things like that, they're all surfaced out. And then the button to launch the Cloud Shell, that's really the thing that's coming into all these admin centers. Yeah, and it even says that. Like once you launch it, it's welcome to the Azure Cloud Shell, type AZ to use the Azure CLI, authenticating to Azure, build your Azure Drive. But like you said, all the Microsoft 365 commandlets are there. So I can go like connect dash Microsoft Teams. It's not going to ask for authentication or anything. It's just going to connect me right away to Microsoft Teams and I can start running all my PowerShell against Teams, Office 365, all of that. But 
Yes, that is a good call. It is just the Azure Cloud Shell with all of the Microsoft Office, Microsoft 365, Office 365 modules there. And you can go just start writing PowerShell. So while we're talking about Cloud Shell, a uh, quick tip for anybody that that does this, like if you've ever had a need to work with multiple Cloud Shells at the same time, and I don't know if this is going to work different on the team side when they add the button, but typically that button actually just launches straight into portal.azure.com slash Cloud Shell, and then you can kind of see things up and running there. If you go to shell.azure.com, you can launch distinct versions and distinct instances, not versions, instances of the Cloud Shell, which is also a fun like little trick. So if you need to open, say, like three Cloud Shells at once, you need three of those different Cloud Shell instances running, you can just go to shell.azure.com and you know launch that in as many windows as you need to, which is kind of fun to do. Yeah, it is especially coming from... The Mac side of thing, where not everything always works in PowerShell. Although I guess Cloud Shell is it? It's running core, isn't it? It's not running. It is, yeah. So you should have most of the tooling there. So for things that like don't work all the way in PowerShell the way you think they should, or they're just not where you want them to be, there's a bunch of alternative tooling that's available to you as like even community projects. So the, the for instance, the Microsoft 365 CLI that open source project is also included in the Cloud Shell now. Yeah. Well, and I suppose some of my problem is that I'm on a Mac, so even though they're both running core, I end up missing certain DLL or certain things that are still there for Windows that I think Core can leverage on Windows that just aren't there on the Mac. That don't exist in a Linux container running in somebody else's data yeah, center. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, it's a nice handy way to kind of launch PowerShell. And again, another nice thing is you don't need credentials. Like you don't have to log in. It just picks up your credentials because you've already logged into the admin center and connects you right away to these various services. Yeah, it's basically whatever you're logged into Azure AD with. But if you need to connect as like an alternative account, like a service principal, things like that, you can always do that Do that as well. That is all available. Although, have you tried? You probably can if it requires MFA. If you're trying to log in as like a global admin with MFA access, because you really can't do... Will it let you do like an interactive login from the cloud shell? No interactive logins, but anything that uses like the device login flow, that that, that all works over there. Got so it. when I say like a service principle, maybe you've deployed a like an enterprise application in Azure AD and you've granted that application some permissions to the graph, you could authenticate as long as you knew the app ID and the client secret for that to 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 go ahead and connect that way. So so it is it it is all testable, all kind of doable. In, in the cloud shell. I'm, I'm actually a really big fan of it. Like, like you said, not just from the Mac side of things. I use it on my, my iPad as well. Like I really despise the Azure mobile app. Like it just has some weird things going on. But one of the few <laughs> things the Azure mobile app does really well is it lets you launch instances of the cloud shell on a mobile device. So not so great on a phone. Like you're not going to be, you know, typing a missive or anything on there. But on my iPad, it's great because I've got a keyboard and then you just have access to that same shell, your cloud drive, all your tooling, things like that. Yeah, I was just looking. Maybe I misinterpreted that. I got to try something now. Connect. Oh, okay. So tidbit here, Scott. Not all of the Office 365 modules are there. I wonder if I misread this in terms of it coming to the Teams Admin Center. If it was more that the Teams module is included. So of all the Office 365 modules, like connect, because like the, the SharePoint Online module is not there. If I go look at the modules, I get all my AZ modules, like my Azure AD modules, all my AZ compute, network, storage. I have the Microsoft Teams module. You should have Exchange as well. But I do not, I do not. Connect EXO. The ex, oops, it helps if I spell it right. Connect EXO. Yep. So that one, sh that one works, but it doesn't show up in my list of modules. But Connect SPO does not work. The SharePoint modules don't appear to be there. Yeah, I wonder if it still has some dependency on, on something for certain versions that don't play nice in that Linux environment. And the PNP one that I use is not a Microsoft, it's not an official Microsoft one. It's in there, the PNP repository, but some of those you can go install as well. The PNP one, you can also, like I said, run the, the Microsoft 365 CLI, which is the node-based one. Yep, so something to play with but also some gotchas to be aware of when it comes to 
some of that stuff. And there's always gotchas with everything. There is always gotchas. So you want to know another kind of interesting one here? Yeah, let's do one more. Retention labels or retention policies, not retention labels. I need to be very clear with the differentiation there. Retention policies for private channel messages in your compliance center. So for instance, let's say you are in some highly regulated compliant environment and you need to ensure that users or admins or anybody do not delete chat messages in channels. You can go in and set retention policies now And when you choose which location you want to apply these retention policies to, you get an option for private channel messages. And you can essentially say, automatically delete messages after a certain period of time or do not allow messages to be deleted in these private channels that that are less than X number of years old. So we're going to keep all messages in Teams In these private channels for five years, nobody's allowed to delete any message from a private channel for five years. Gotcha. Is that all rolled out today? Like, I I remember there were some announcements about that back in June, July, when it popped up on the roadmap. So is that kind of globally available and and out everywhere it needs to be now? It is, and it does not appear to be a preview either. This appears to be like out there... So if I go into the Compliance Center, so compliance.microsoft.com, and that is the correct URL, and go create like a new retention policy, you can go through, give it a name, give it a type, adaptive versus static, which is another relatively new thing. And then all of these toggle boxes now, I have a lot of the standard ones we used to have, Exchange, Email, SharePoint Sites, OneDrive Accounts, Microsoft 365 Groups, Skype for Business is still in there. Don't know why that one's still in there because that should be completely gone now. Exchange Public Folders, another one. Oh, just stay away from those. But then you have Teams Channel Messages, Teams Chats, Teams Private Channel Messages, and then you actually have Yammer Community Messages and Yammer User Messages. And the two Yammer ones are still labeled as preview. Everything else is showing as generally available. Those adaptive scopes, those are pretty new, right? Those are in preview right now? Those are. And I saw, I saw Joanne... Klein tweet about them a few weeks ago. So I think these were one of those that rolled out before Ignite or there was some knowledge about them before Ignite, but they were announced again. And these are kind of cool too, because prior to this, when you would go apply these, you had to essentially like pick and choose where you were going to apply these different retention labels. Sometimes you had to go pick SharePoint sites, you had to pick exchange mailboxes or you had to pick them all. Now, before you do retention policies, you have a new tab under information governance that's adaptive scopes. And this lets you set rules as to, I lost my edit button, as to where you want retention policies applied. So for instance, I can choose within an adaptive scope, either a SharePoint site or a Microsoft 365 group that I want this to apply to, but then define use attributes to define which users, which SharePoint sites, or which Microsoft 365 groups should be in this scope. So you can use things like names, descriptions, custom attributes in Azure AD. For users, you can use departments. For SharePoint sites, you can use some of those refinable strings from SharePoint search. And then essentially you go in and create these adaptive scopes and it'll dynamically add, remove, people, sites, groups to these scopes based on those attributes. And when you go in and set a retention policy now, instead of choosing static and applying it to a static set of mailboxes, sites, whatever, you choose adaptive. And then you can pick these scopes that you've pre-created. And then those certain retention policies will only apply to groups, SharePoint sites, users, again, it uses that to determine where these should apply. And then it will only apply to people that match that criteria that you set 
in the adaptive scope. Gotcha. So it just gives you some more flexibility. Again, maybe these probably apply more for certain compliance, like if you're in a certain financial financial organization or something like that, and certain sets of users or certain content that you work with needs to have certain retention policies versus something like a team that you created to organize company events probably don't need retention policies. So it gives you some flexibility there. So you don't have to, it's not kind of that all or nothing or a manually going in and configuring these every time a new site or a new team or something gets created. Yes. So that was kind of an interesting one. I feel like there was one other one that I saw. I can't remember now. What else do I have on my list? Oh, the retained versions of a file sent. This is probably a good one to wrap up with because this falls into this as well. There was a bunch of stuff around retention and information governance. So here's another one for you, Scott. Have you ever wanted to know, not from a retention perspective, you didn't have to necessarily retain a specific file, but you had to retain a specific version of a file that maybe you shared with somebody. Because files can be changed, right? So Scott emailed me a file one year ago. Since then, the file's been updated, been modified. But for whatever reason, he needs to retain that specific version that he sent me a year ago. That's what this new retain versions of files sent with a Teams message or exchange does. So it does appear that it requires auto-labeling based on where this gets configured. But this one, once you set it, allows you to set a retention policy not necessarily on the file as a whole. The file can still be edited, updated, modified, deleted, whatever. But the retention policy will apply to that very specific version of the file that was shared via Teams or shared via an email. Nifty. Yeah. I thought that one was kind of... It was one of those I hadn't really thought about before. And then when I saw this announcement, I was like, "Ah, I guess that makes sense that... Can you look? I always go to the financial and in, or financial industry. Like maybe you're going public and you shared certain contents for or certain files for SEC filings, and those have to be retained for a certain period of time. And that version that you registered with the SEC or whatever that process is has to be retained. You can now set a retention policy to make sure that when those files are shared, they are retained. And this one I have not seen surface in my tenant yet. There's a setting for it when you go set up auto policies to select this. There's a link we can put in the show notes too that Microsoft has a screenshot showing where this option is and what it looks like. But that is one that I haven't seen appear yet for me. Someday it'll be there. (laughs) Someday. Who knows? But yeah, that was some of the highlights. There were a bunch of other ones too. There were some updates to audit logs, auditing messages in Teams, some stuff around device management, some stuff around information barriers. Good announcements. Those were not nearly as exciting to me as some of the other ones we just talked about. So we can put some links to some of that too in the show notes. If Scott feels so inclined to grab them out of slides and stick them in our show notes. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll have a bunch of stuff in there. And even things that like you didn't have links for in, in your slides. I'll make sure that they're... In mine, you found them. Th- they are all included along the way. And so cool. Now that we've had a chance to talk about Teams a little bit, let's switch gears and talk about Azure. So Scott, do you know how many files are shared outside your organization? Or are you sure that every team in your Microsoft 365 tenant has a valid owner? Guess what? ShareGate's got your back. After helping thousands of customers move to Office 365, they've learned that success in the cloud involves more than just migration. That's why they created ShareGate Apricot, an automated governance platform for Microsoft Teams and Microsoft 365 groups. ShareGate Apricot can help you answer questions like these without planning unnecessary restrictions on your users. With ShareGate Apricot, you get full visibility across each team's life cycle from creation all the way through to archival. You can automate manual tasks involved in identifying problem areas like inactive or orphan teams. And you can collaborate with team owners on corrective measures to keep your teams tidy and secure. That's also why they've combined ShareGate Desktop, their trusted migration and content management tool, with ShareGate Apricot in a single subscription so that you have everything you need to be successful in the Microsoft cloud. 
I'm here with Henry Yan. He's a product marketing manager at Microsoft, and I'm super excited to have this conversation. We're going to talk about a new upcoming digital event that we have at Microsoft called Azure IaaS Day. And we're coming off the tail end of Ignite and all the announcements and product releases and things that have come out over there. But I thought it'd be good to just hop in and talk about what IaaS Day is, what folks can expect at the event, and why they should consider consider joining, registering and spending some time with us on November 17th to talk about things like compute, networking, and storage. So thanks for joining me today, Henry. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Scott, and thanks for having me. So let's go ahead and get right into it. I think you know, you know, coming that off of ignite the way we are, like, what type of content can folks expect at this event? You know, I, I tend to view ignite maybe um, sometimes I get a little cynical about it, both as an external and an internal. You know, it can be a little bit a little bit high level sometimes, and you know, with IAS Day, it gives us an opportunity to potentially come and do much deeper dives around areas of infrastructure as a service, so compute, networking, and storage. Yeah, sure. And that's a great point. And you know, since you know us and other you know other companies have gone to this format of digital events. And for those who are familiar with this, the way the in-person events were in the past, for example, for Ignite, you you're right, you would we would have the high-level sessions covering what's new and all the, the latest and greatest um, across all the different areas. But in in-person, you also had a, a lot of breakout sessions where you could attend to get that deeper dive content and information on specific services, whether you are you want to learn about the latest, you know, you know, the latest releases and capabilities in disk storage or in compute. And since we've transitioned to the, the virtual format Ignite, that's one of the elements I think that we're a little bit missing. And when you look at the, when we think about these core kind of IS services like compute storage network, there's a lot of, you know, depth and, and complexity that come along with these services. So kind of where Azure IS Day fits in is, you know, at Ignite, you'll kind of get some insight into what's what's new and what's what's the latest releases. But but then as a follow up, Eyes Day, you can actually go. We'll go deeper into those the latest VMs and the latest in storage. So how we've structured the event is that um, it's a two hour event, and we'll have parallel tracks in compute, storage, and networking. So regardless of what track you attend, you know, you'll have a key that um, Aaron Chapel, who's the CVP of Azure Core, who who will be kicking off. And then shortly after that, you'll have deep dive sessions in those specific areas. So really, you can get more insight into what we covered at Ignite that will kind of help you learn more about the services and how these will kind of um, be relevant to your to your day-to-day job. That's awesome. Are there any new services? Like when I think of, you know, potentially some deep dive scenarios, like it's always nice to see what's new, new out there, but it's also sometimes nice to see alignment to customer scenarios or what we see our customers doing. So are, are those kind of where demo are going and targeting? Yeah, definitely. And in, in, in all the, the tracks and all the deep dive sessions for almost all the sessions, there will be demos and, and you can really show how you, how you can use those technologies and services in a real world scenario. And you know, we find that you know, our customers, you know, not only learning about you know, how these services work and kind of the, the technical components of it, but actually seeing these being used in, in, in real life, those, those are really helpful. So definitely you'll see in all of the sessions, there will be, you know, one or two demos just really showcasing how how these um, technologies work in, in the real world. Yep. And I think beyond that, you know, beyond technology, like, you know, we'll talk about things maybe in the compute track, like the new virtual machine selector. Like, hey, this helps you pick your compute units based on specific workloads, your budget, things like that. Like, that's great from a product side. But we also have this inherent push to get our customers educated on our platform and help them understand what it is. So there's opportunities for them as well hopefully to learn things about some of the new exams that we have coming out that line up either around role-based motions. So, you know, I'm a I'm a solutions architect or I'm an infrastructure architect, a developer, a DevOps engineer, things like that. 
Or we also have some newer certifications out around specific specialties. So they might not be so role-based a lot, but they could be around a particular pillar, maybe like compute, network storage, things like that. Or they could also be around even a specific technology, like we've launched some new certifications around Cosmos DB, things like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, And one of the certifications that customers and attendees will learn about at the event is our, our the latest uh, Azure Network Engineer Associate certification, which is a new training for, like you mentioned, those that are very specialized, especially as an example in the networking space, you have a lot of uh, network engineers and, and specialized folks that are coming from on-prem and maybe their skills are very specialized to what the environment looks like on-prem and they're now moving into the cloud and need to build up these skills and learn these new skills that are different in the cloud to be able to take on some of these complex tasks that they have with, with regards to networking. So we have a new Network Engineer Associate Certification as, as well as the, the new AZ700 exam that is a prerequisite to get certified as part of this certification. So really enabling you know those folks that are in these roles to, to gain the skills they need to be successful as they are transitioning from um, on-prem to the cloud. Yeah, which which is always great to see. Like we go through these motions of, you know, making that transition from on-premises to cloud. And sometimes we forget about what's ours or what's the responsibility of a hosting provider. Like, you know, when I think about like network engineers who might be sitting in their data centers today and they're managing things at lower layers of the OSI stack and then they come up and they go to Azure and they go, oh, I can't do any of that layer three stuff anymore. I'm stuck at kind of layer four, layer seven. Like, what can I do and how do I move forward? These specialties certifications are awesome for doing that. So like you said, like the new AZ700 exam, which is designing and implementing Microsoft Azure networking solutions, you can go out and sit that exam and and you can go view all this today. I'll include links in the show notes to everybody to go view things like the objective domains and the skills that the skills outlines for this, but you can go ahead and do that. And one exam, the AZ700, you are a Microsoft certified Azure network engineer associate, which is kind of cool to see. And there's been some other exams too coming around out around specific services. Like I know uh, just from like a learning perspective, we've had Cosmos DB certifications come out. When I think about other core services, like even where we don't have maybe specialty certifications, so storage PG, and that's near and dear to my heart, we don't have a specialty certification like this. But we also work with the learn teams to make sure that we're aligned and that we're pushing out the right types of materials into even existing exams. So customers might uh, see like, in market exams like the Azure Solutions Architect exam. We used to have the 303, 304, and it was announced recently that that's going to the 305. Like all the things that you see in the 305 for storage, I, I know a bunch of us spent a, a good amount of time on that, making sure that that was aligned and, and was kind of sitting in the, the same area. So let's be realistic about these core services. So like Henry and I are talking about core. For us, that's Azure Core, and that's compute networking and storage. And let's make sure that we're pushing out the right types of information, not only from a documentation side, but we're also educating customers in the right way as they're coming onto coming onto the platform. Which I, th- I think is always like a- one last thing for IAS Day. Like I had a lot of fun doing our storage day last year, and one of the things that I was doing in our storage day last year was not presenting, but it was acting as a SME and answering questions for customers and attendees in real time. And we're going to be doing the same types of things this year again. So you, you want to talk a little bit about that, about like how, you know, what types of questions we'll be able to answer? Yeah, sure. And you're know, going back to when we did have you know, the in-person events. You know, I'm, I know that a lot of uh, what, you know, both attendees and on the Microsoft, what, you know, we found valuable is being able to connect with customers. And, you know, when we had the booths, being able to talk to, talk to each other and ask questions on the spot. So that's very valuable. I think that interaction and, you know, in virtual events, while we can't necessarily you know, replicate that exactly, for eyes that we, you know, we wanted to make sure that we had element of that component where attendees can connect with your know, Microsoft experts. And during this, throughout the whole event, there will be your know, live Q and A in the chat. So as you know, people are, are are learning about the latest 
releases and seeing the demos, they can easily ask questions in the chat and we'll have we have we'll have SMEs kind of lined up throughout the answering questions and you know following up if needed. And so it's really a great opportunity for people uh, attending to to get their you know, the questions quickly answered or to make that quick connection if you with, with product experts who are actually working and building those um, releases that we'll be talking about. Yeah, I think that's one of the best parts about it is, you know, come in and provide us feedback in real time, get answers to your questions. And like you said, in in-person events, we didn't really consider that a closed feedback loop. We'd always want to hear from you afterwards. So we'll certainly be providing ways that you can connect with all of us as well, whether that's through the product side and whatever it happens to be. And and we'll get you up and running and make sure that you're successful like a bunch of our other customers, which I, th- I think is another kind of key point when we're showing kind of demos and, and learnings and things on the platform. You'll also not be just hearing kind of, I, I think, the, the architecture side of things, but also how customers who use Azure today are successful on the platform and they're building out these solutions that leverage virtual machines, virtual networking, maybe like high throughput disk storage, object storage offerings like uh, NFS or data lake storage, like those will all be real world learnings that are coming forward for everybody as well. Yep, exactly. And, you know, as you mentioned with, you know, not only seeing the, the technologies in action through demos and, and through some of the deep dive content, but, you know, a lot of the sessions will be, will be highlighting, you know, real world customer examples, kind of making it relevant to, to customers who come from a variety of of different industries and use cases and kind of seeing you know other customers that are very have similar have faced similar challenges and how they were able to take advantage of you know these core services to to overcome those challenges and be successful. So definitely we'll be sharing a lot of those examples as well. So hopefully customers will find that valuable too. Yeah, that's great. So for those that do want to join us, Azure IaaS Day will be on Wednesday, November 17th. It's going to be from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Pacific time. Like Henry mentioned, we'll have multiple tracks, keynotes for you to go ahead and view. It is a digital event, so you'll be able to follow up with recordings and all those things offline or after the event. You know, if you are really wanting to watch a compute session, but you want to go learn something about networking or storage, you'll you'll have access to all of those as well. And it's a free event, so go and register today and we'd love to see you all on the 17th. Sounds great, Scott, and I hope to see everyone there. Thanks again for having me. Yeah, thank you. If you enjoyed the podcast, go leave us a five-star rating in iTunes. It helps to get the word out so more IT pros can learn about Office 365 and Azure. If you have any questions you want us to address on the show or feedback about the show, feel free to reach out via our website, Twitter, or Facebook. Thanks again for listening and have a great day.